live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Q at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Boston, Massachusetts. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier. My co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is CUBE alumni Brian Weiss, who's the VP and Global Head, Subject Matter Experts at HP Autonomy. Welcome back to theCUBE. Thanks a lot, good to be here. Love to read that title, Ex Subject Matter Experts. Yes, a lot um, of syllables in there. <laughs> um, this is great conversation to have. We'll just kick it off with the Subject Matter Experts. I wish we had a crowd chat up on the main stage during the keynote, yeah. uh, which is kind of a flash mob group discussion, kind of thought leadership going on. But Subject Matter Experts in this new era of social is interesting, so uh, being it's a big data conversation, is that a big part of how things get done now? What does the subject matter experts mean to you? Yeah. Obviously there's two things you look at. One is people love to talk to experts about yeah. stuff. Yeah. Two, with metadata and big data, you know, curating data modeling requires yeah. experts, ontologies, whatnot, right? So is it, is, where is, what does it mean? So what does that mean, subject matter experts to you? Yeah, that's a good question, <laughs> all right. Well, so, um, you know, when you think about subject matter experts and the value they can bring to solving a business problem, right? And if the specific one is either it's in big data, it might be healthcare, it might be electronic discovery and compliance, what my group does really is I, I go look for those people who have deep depth and experience in what they do to help then solve those problems for our customers, right? So you're talking m multiple 10 plus years in their domain. Um, to your specific question around big data, I think there's, an, there's something happening right now in this industry um, and maybe five years from now, we'll be able to come back and check if we're right about this. But you know, right now, everybody's talking about making, getting insight out of information, getting value out of data. And frankly, there's still a lot of people work involved in that. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, you know, we're, everybody's hyped up about data scientists and the era of the data scientists, and everybody's trying to tune their resume. So it sounds like the joke about what's the difference between a data scientist and a statistician, salary, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, uh, but so there, we got this era where I there are that tools. You got that, John? Or got right, that, that, right, that, right, yeah. It's going, it's going <laughs> in crowd chat right now. the gentleman from Postal Service yeah. this morning. Yeah, that is a very good point. But this is the age of the data scientist, right? It's in the same way that, so people who can understand data, make sense out of it, help their, their line of business get value out of or becoming valuable right now in the marketplace. And for me, what that means is there's, a, there's I think, a short window of that where you're going to use all kinds of different tools, right? Whether it's structured or unstructured or Hadoop, et cetera, there's this huge learning curve to get up there. And so there's going to be a lot of people in there. And then over the next five years, someone will say, why am I spending $500,000 on people to do this work when I can really do it with software? So in the same way you see software start to do what people are doing, you increasingly, companies like HP and otherwise, are figuring out how to automate that, how to automate that process. But we're still at the very early stage of it. There's so much exciting work to do. So in answer to your question, I look for people who are very deep on, on, in their domain and as experts to bring them to bear on customer problems. I mean, I just think it's a really key thing, and, and, and I bring it up only because it was in your title, but Dave and I have been talking about this data first, yeah. born, in the, born in the big data market, and subject matter experts is where the sales leads are converting. No, literature is gone with social. You have also automation happening right. and orchestration with artificial intelligence, and some of the things that Autonomy and Vertica does is high performance based stuff. So I see this metadata thing happening, yeah. uh, and certainly the Snowden <laughs> thing highlights it at, yep. a, at a global level. Yep. Um, what, are, what do your customers think? I mean, where are they in that spectrum? Obviously, where is more advanced conversation, but like, at the end yeah. of the day, I just want to get close to my business. I want to orchestrate things, make money, solve my customer problems. Yeah, I think, you know, as, um, as we get into these conversations with companies and who have big data projects, right, and who want to who know they can get value out of their, their information and can get competitive advantage, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of times they simply don't know where to start and how to get there. And so the idea that I want to get closer to my business, for us it's how do I take the infrastructure, how do I take the, the, the stuff between the data I've got and the insight I need to get, right? And that was our conversation. Jeff was here talking yeah. about idle on demand, right? The fastest way to get to that is not have to set up idle, ingest a bunch of data, figure out what I want, questions I want. How about we host that for you and you ask the questions? Right, so how do I take out the stuff in between the insight and the data itself, and there's a lot of technology in there, and go to, and speed that up? Uh, and so what we ask people is, what are you trying to do and why? 
what's the point of this big data? Actually, are you playing with Hadoop because you think it's a good thing to do and because <laughs> you've got some budget and everybody says it's cool? Or do you have a business reason for executing on this? And that point, what are the right tools? Let's bring that up, because this is something Dave pointed out earlier with Jeff Kelly, his study, is that there's a big schism between IT and uh, right. the business users. Yep. And that is, is that, hey, I want to see the meat on the bone in terms of the uh, project. Yeah. IT guys think they're successful, but yet 18% in his survey said it's not. So there's a mismatch. IT's like just, they're geeking out on big data. Well, but they're checking the boxes, they go, great, we're done. But wait a minute, the business guys are saying, wait a minute, where's the beef? So What's the point? <laughs> yeah, so this is where, this is an interesting conversation. Uh -huh. You know, we talk about retargeting, short-term, long-term gain. These, yeah. are the, these are the challenges. What looked good in the short-term might not be the outcome. Well, that, you know, the, the interesting, you know, I, uh, what I like about this conference, and so we're here, it was a year ago, right, when we sat down and we were talking about, you know, the, the explosive interest in big data. And at that time, I, I would say I'm hearing more conversations that are being driven by what the business outcome needs to be as opposed to let me go play with the tools. I would say a year ago, and I don't know if you're having the same experience talking to people here at this conference, but the customers who are coming here are not, they're beyond the I, I want to mess around with technologies that can host more, can manage more information and distribute compute across it. They're coming with a business problem. Yeah. They're saying I need to look at you know, uh, my customers and I need to understand what they're going to say and be able to drive really more sales out of it, not just say, okay, they're interested in X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I think two years ago, it was a lot of kick in the tires. Last year, a lot of proof of concepts, and yep. now it's like real, real business value. I wanted to ask you, so we think about autonomy's ascendancy. Um, things like the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure certainly helped. Yep. Um, and at the time, as you guys were you know, exploding, the general counsel was really driving the bus. It was yep. information was a liability. Yep. Um, now we're probably talking about his information as an asset, as mm -hmm. value. So who's in charge these days? Is it still <laughs> the GC? Is it the yeah. CMO? Yeah. Where are we? That's a great. That's a great question. So you throw the CM in, CMO in there, which is a bit of a of a of a, as a wild card in it. But um, you got to break it down into two different poles. One of which is cost and risk, right? And you've got a whole group of people who look at information from a cost and risk perspective, and that's where your GC sits, right? And then there's a whole group of people saying there's value and, 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 and there's business value and money in that data, right? I can learn something about it. So the pendulum is either cost and, 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 and they're actually uh, fighting. Yeah, right? I was going to say, the does, does value trump risk or no? No. no. It doesn't. Well, not, it depends not, on the well, industry, uh, I guess. It depends on the industry, but see, here <laughs> we get back to the point. So great, value. How much value, yeah. right? How much value is it to not, to, to not get sued or to win that case, right? So the, historically, a lot of what we're seeing um, is, is you get the folks who are really, really good at mining data and understanding, the, the, funny enough is these people are doing the risk and cost management. They're the ones who are looking for fraud and communications around stock trades. They're the ones that are using advanced tagging and categorization and, and um, what we call automated coding for electronic discovery. The funny thing is those guys are really, really good at finding a needle in a haystack cheaply, okay? which is the same business proposition as trying to figure out what's going on in information so I can capitalize on so the value. So you say stop fighting and get So what we are seeing with them get together. <laughs> I go to these e-discovery conferences and the, the lawyers are there talking about the value of the data. So the beautiful thing is, is where projects to delve deeply into say categorization. It's a great, great example. Um, instead of reacting to the information once I've been sued, help me go find the data and do it cheaper. Organizations are moving toward the middle and say help me categorize my data ahead of the fact. Think about that. How are you going to categorize your data? You've got a half a petabyte of data, and I want to know what each one means. I want you to automate that for me. Well, I want you to automate another, that for me. And the reason I want you to automate that for me, one side of the aisle says, is because there's cost and risk in there. I want to delete it, right? I want you to automate because I want you to show me what's trash, and I don't want to host it anymore. And then there's the other side, or I want to know what's on legal hold, right? I want to know. I want the potential smoking, and I don't have time to read it. Let the computer do the work. And then there's the other side of it says, I'll fund that project because I know there's business value in there. I can see the patterns of behavior in my workforce. I can see what they're writing about. I can see what they're saying. I can, I can mine that. And so we're seeing these beautiful conversations of people who wouldn't ordinarily get together. Yeah, but I, I, buy, that, I buy the thesis there, and I, but yeah. I want to add a complication to it, and this is Please. the interesting one. So I, I agree with you that if I'm looking at my risk cost yeah. to store the data and take more of a compliance view versus the upside yeah. that's not coming home yet, yep. quote, fin crossing the finish line and value, which is what you're saying, that's okay, I buy that. Yep. However, let's throw in another caveat. Let's just change the game in there. So if you change it to, I will pay HP or IBM or other vendor for their 
pre-package approved global platform versus open source, which yeah. is more of a, uh, a lagging time to value right. equation, which you're pointing to. Now that complicates it. So now I, want, I can buy Vertica or Autonomy or other solutions, sure. get the time to value faster. So do you optimize for well, see, time I, to value or do you optimize for compliance risk management? That is going to be ultimately, you know, I, open I, source I, I can see that lagging, but like when you say, okay, I got Vertica Autonomy, yeah, I mean, is your question whether or not there's, um, whether sort of people do it themselves with open source faster than they will to take a, you know, a, a productized approach to it? Because the, the you know, folks like, like HP are the ones who are going to okay. productize and bulletproof this stuff, and we're going to build solutions around it that actually a CIO will buy. Well, I'm, I'm bullish right. on open source. My point is that open source by itself is longer time to value. That's kind of what's being, right, yeah. people are, are agreeing on that. And it's free, you buy, you get what you pay for, and the security's filling the holes in global issues. Right. But if I buy Vertica, I don't have, I save time with more of the standardization, the, the Ferrari, and that, yeah, it's still got open source support, so I have that luxury. Yep. Yep. But now I'm buying a time to value equation, so I have a time to value equation that's faster with buying versus free open source. So that's kind of what we're hearing from customers. When, and that, so that's a separate, yeah. dimension that you're saying, which is risk versus the upside. So if I can buy a faster time to value with HP, what do I optimize for? So now it's all about the focus. So what am I optimizing <coughs> for? And program management policy. Am I optimizing for risk management compliance or am I optimizing time to value? It's just, that's, a, I don't know the answer. Well, it's, funny it's interesting you, to I, you, right? I think you end up, we're in this kind of lovely place where you're almost doing both. Right. So, um, you know, we people see people wanting to do legacy data cleanup, whether it's structured data or unstructured data, they want to just get rid of systems and all that, but you can't because you don't know what the information means. And this is the unstructured stuff. I can always do a structured analysis and say, it hasn't been touched for three years, it's three years old, and it's a word file. Metadata, I can do metadata, man. but what's it about, right? What's the actual document about? Is it, a, is it a lunch menu or is it a critical document for my business? So being able to categorize and tag things is the same technology that I would need to do a big data conversation, right, with my CMO, than th that I would to be able to, you know, with my compliance folks. So basically, you get two pots of money to dig into. That's compliance guy comes to the table and says, "I'm going to buy this technology to be able to figure out what I should and shouldn't keep and what might be on legal hold." And by the way, you guys on the big data side, look what you're going to get for my dollar. So, but there are differences, right? Because the the, the risks of getting it wrong are higher. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. On the, on the legal side yeah, than they uh, are on the big data side. I mean, yeah. you can iterate in the big data side and say, oops. Uh, but I suppose you can iterate in the, on the legal side as well. Yep. Um, so where are we in terms of being able to auto-classify, auto-categorize data at, at, at scale? I mean, you guys obviously search is yeah. you know, the heart and soul. Yeah. Uh, but in some case, I mean, you're kind of using search as a blunt instrument, right? Uh, and so um, yeah. I still need to pull a lot of data in as the data grows. If, I, if, if, if I've got a, if I'm paying lawyers yeah. to do searches, it's expensive. So if you could auto categorize, that's right. might save me some dough and then search on a smaller well, corpus the, of data. That's really the secret sauce of what we're doing with unstructured information. Um, and it's, it's having you know, the computer automate, computer automated insight, right? So what you might ordinarily require a person to do, the machine can do a lot of that work. It can tell you what the document's about. It can, here, here's a phrase, find similar. So if I hand you a document and say, go get me things that are like this. One, you have to make a decision about what it's about. And maybe it's not a two sentence tweet, it's a 40 page document. So you have to read it, find out, figure out what matters and what doesn't matter and figure out what's similar and you don't just go look for things that have the same word in it. <laughs> it's conceptual and so that underlying technology ability to do almost to get insight out of that in human ways is what really what autonomy is about and we're using it broadly power, you know, the big data proposition. And how do you address the fact that, that data is distributed in nature now with mobile more yeah. so than ever. <clears throat> well, I, I don't want to put it all into a single repository, right? Yeah. That doesn't work. That's kind of been the, the you know, I, I think the, the 1.0 version of that is, is, has tripped over that, really. Yeah. Is, is, and the way we think about it and talk about it is you need connected intelligence. You need intelligence, you need connectivity. You got to solve the connectivity problem. Nobody's going to move it into a big bucket in order to make sense out of it. It just doesn't, there's nobody's going to do that in their business process. Um, you need to be able to connect to data sources, you need to be able to and understand the variety of information, the video, the audio, right? They're both, that's both unstructured, uh, as well as free text. And how do I look at all that in the same context and ask or interrogate that same set of data with one intelligent view? And by the way, I have to do it securely. So I have to still, 
honor <laughs> the underlying security mode uh, or the underlying security framework of the documents in the repository. So I got to be able to do all of that in the enterprise at scale and give you human insight across it. Um, and this is, there's, you know, I think I mentioned we're moving from tire kicking in the yeah, yeah. Um, in the mode where I think the business problems are becoming front and center in these big data conversations. Uh, we're, we've got some really exciting ones in there. Um, this afternoon, uh, we're going to be talking about our healthcare initiative. And uh, this is a, an, a great use case of where you get, um, you take an example of where there's an awful lot of very rich information. And the rich information is structured, semi-structured, and frankly, really unstructured. And that's patient information, right? So you th when, when a doctor makes a diagnosis and mm -hmm. they make notes about you and coming in, they, they take those notes and, that, and sometimes those notes have structured information and they don't and they're dictations and there's all kinds of, it, it's very difficult to make sense out of that information. And historically, what has happened in the medical industry is that all gets put down to one code, which is the billing code. So all the things that happen in this information, it's like the, it's the travesty of, of you know, ETL in the medical world is that at the end of everything I've learned about you and what might be, and I have to say, and I'm going to bill it to the following code. So read a 500-page book and give me one code to describe it. Now, what if I could take all that other information, what you said, how you said it, and I, I, can, I can take those descriptions and correlate it with other types of information, whether it's um, structured or unstructured, right? There's all these data systems that are out there. If I can connect to those, and if I can also analyze the, doc, the notes itself and understand, we can look at patterns of not only how people are talking about what's happening, but what's actually happening. Um, we've got a project with Stanford Children's Hospital we've been running for about two and a half years now, um, and they're doing exactly this. Uh, and they're able to look at, at you know, increasing their standard of care, increasing their efficiencies. Um, it's really a tremendous project. And you know, we, it's not on TV, but we'll be talking about it later this well, afternoon. Well, you're going to go on, on to, you're going to speak to this audience with, with Dr. Better. John Palma of Stanford, right? Yep. So, what, so can you take us through more of that case study? I mean, what are they actually yeah. doing? Well, first of all, as a backdrop, because you know, I'm in Palo Alto, Stanford, right. I know, is doing a ton of big data across all their disciplines. It's pretty much been right. infiltrated across, you know, from cancer research to all kinds of stuff. So they, right. they are really doing some great work. So go ahead. And so for, so for, they're going through all of the records they have that are associated with, you know, with patient care. Um, and they're looking at the way in which the, the system is describing, right, the tag that's been associated with that. But they're digging deeper and looking at the way in which any of the free text fields, which are associated with that, so then the way the customer described, customer, see here I'm talking about customer, the way the client might have described what they were, ha what's happening to them, the way the doctor may have described what's happening to them. And they're able to draw correlations out of that information, which are very different perhaps from the way that the information was coded, right? Um, because they don't, they don't talk about things in a similar way, right? So uh, difficulty of breathing might be abbreviated DOB, which is date of birth. Yeah. Right. Um, the, all of the problems around understanding context and semantics around, you know, uh, he, he denies having any chest pain. Well, if I'm just looking for chest pain and I haven't understood that it's in the context of denying something, right? So the way people talk about things is not always coded into rows and columns, and so we, they're pulling this data out and, and able to run really lovely analytics on what's more likely happening than the way things have been coded. So their standard of care, and, and what's beautiful about it is that they're getting to a point where if they can really do this across not only their data, but other healthcare data, right? So it's not just Stanford's hospital's data. It's if, they, if you could do this writ large, you, you, start to, you start to do really you know, proactive medicine in a different way. All right, so I got to ask the, the, the question. I mean, it sounds eerily similar to IBM Watson in a way. What's, what's similar, what's different? Well, the te there's, there's significant technology differences. Right, um, you know, what's, what Watson does and what it can do at scale, um, you know, IDLE has a whole different set of capabilities. Uh, it's more based on a probability model than a natural, la natural language processing. Although when you look at healthcare, you kind of have to do all of it, right? So you have to do not only what IDLE will do with probability modeling, but natural language processing as well as any kind of ontology and lexicons from Snowbend and the dictionaries, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of everything that, that, you know, we have, including some of it coming from HP Labs. Um, using idle, using autonomy, and then as this progresses out, we'll get into you know, much deeper, larger data lakes of information. So it's really apples and oranges, um, but it's, uh, you know, to me it's a very exciting place where we really 
could potentially change the way we do medicine. And, and it applies. We had a question from the audience today. When are we going to hear from you know big data not getting people to click on ads yeah, and yeah. drive so revenue? Yeah, selling more stuff. But when to, are you going to help me? To change yeah. the world and, yeah. and improve the human condition. And uh, well, how would you answer that question? Are we seeing it already? Is it we on the cusp of that? Is well, I think we're at the beginning of it, <laughs> to be honest. I think we're at the very beginning of that process. And innovators like Stanford Children's, um, who clearly see that, I mean, we have, you know, if I asked you to describe one piece with one field, it, it doesn't, it's not right. There's so much rich information out there, and if we could tap it in a way that we could make use of it for every clinician that's out there, um, we could really change things. And so mm -hmm. there are innovators out there, Stanford and other ones, who see this very clearly. Yeah. It's, it's right human information. It's human right information. It. It's real value add. It changes your life. Yeah. Um, so big data changing the world, helping people live longer. Yep. Trends like Fitbit and these things are here. Well, you, know, you add that to Internet of Things, and you add all yeah, the you know yeah. all, all of the, the data we're pulling off of people, yeah. um, and whether they checked into Stanford Children's or not, right? But that all become, becomes a data source and a data set that's worldwide, yeah, yep. and you start to it's very tantalizing. Uh, if you free the data, good things can happen. That's what <laughs> yep. we got to do, unleash the data. Yeah. <laughs> with and, and, you know, medicine's really interesting right now because it's moved from a, from a um, you know, the pressure on it is not about fee for service, it's about fee for performance. And also yeah. the personalization of medicine means that we really need to be proactive and manage somebody before they get to the emergency room. And both of those things drive analytics. The only way you're going to achieve those is by getting better information out of the data that you have and adjusting your system accordingly. Brian, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Uh, here in the big data, you guys are doing some great work, obviously, human information to business, commercial, enterprise, all the above internet of things all happening. Great to be here, great to hear all those stories. Um, and love the epic tweet, there's been a statistician and a data scientist. Salary, Salary. <laughs> great, great job. Thanks for that quote. We'll be right back Wasn't with our mine. next- It came up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Take care.